If you're hungry for an upgrade, and I, I said it in the first service, but I feel like I was supposed to say it again. Our environment needs what Richie's carrying. Our environment needs an upgrade, so I'm pulling on it, and I want you to pull on it. If you're watching at home, I want you to pull, pull on this. So if you're ready for an upgrade, I want you to stand up one more time and just welcome Rich as he comes to blow it up. Come on. So good. So good. Uh, come on. It's so fun to be at Bethel Austin, my favorite church to preach to. Come on. You guys look happy. Are you happy? It's got to be the best place in the earth when we get to come together and worship Jesus and remember that we were once in darkness, but now we're in light. We were once lost, but now we're saved. And to remember that, and I had a, a lot of fun in the first service. I don't know about you guys, but I just love to preach the gospel. I love to talk about the gospel. Matter of fact, um, I would like nothing more than just to read John 8 right now. Or, or, or Luke 15, just word for word, and just give an invitation for salvation. Even to a room full of believers. I might, don't tempt me. Listen, I tell, I tell pastors everywhere I go in the world, preach the gospel every Sunday to your congregation. And give an invitation for salvation, even if you know everyone, even if it's a 50-person church and you know every single person in there is saved, do it anyway. Listen, my kids, they learn by repetition and by observation. The more that they see me do something, I talked about my son. I'm going to talk about my daughter a little bit in this service because I get to because I have the mic, so I get to talk about my kids. And I promise you're going to like the story that I share. But I talked about my son in the first service, and, and he's like preaching the gospel to everything that moves. Every time we're out, he says, do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you believe it in your heart? And he's asking these questions, and he's learning to preach the gospel. And we preach the gospel to one another because we're, by repetition, building the muscle to share the gospel as a lifestyle. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but how can they hear unless somebody preaches? we got to be those that testify because we can't help ourselves. Because it's all we think about. It's because we can't help talking about Jesus because we can't help thinking about Jesus and we can't help but, but love on Jesus and it's out of the overflow of our heart. <laughs> so one of the ways that I practice and Joaquin mentioned it is I'll go on social media. How many people have a Facebook account? How many people have an Instagram account? Some kind of other social media account. I think that pretty much speaks to everyone. You have an automatic platform to share whatever you want. And I'm telling you, you should share the gospel on your platform more than you share anything else. If you believe this, if you believe that faith comes by hearing, I'm telling you, I want to challenge you as leaders. I know that this, tonight we can't be with the whole family if you're watching online Hi, I love you. I can't wait to come back and be with you in person and pray with you. Um, and I believe that even, I don't know if they're going to make this broadcast shareable, but you should share the broadcast and tag all your friends and family that don't yet know Jesus in the broadcast because that's how we're seeing people get born again. Live, every day, at least two to four people every day, just on my broadcast, getting saved. And the way that we do it is we get you to follow our Facebook or wherever we're going live. And it, we do a show that's that or a, a, um, some kind of um, topic, a training. Um, I've been doing prophetic evangelism because it's easy. And I get to talk about prophecy and prophesy over people and train people in prophetic evangelism. So we say, we'll prophesy over you. We'll minister to you. We'll, we'll pray for healing. And at some point, I'll bring a guest on like Joaquin Evans. And I'll say, at some point, Joaquin, I'm going to tell the people who are watching to share the broadcast right now and to tag all your friends and family that you, don't, that you know are not currently walking in relationship with Jesus. Tag them now. And in, in a minute, Joaquin is going to share his testimony 
and he's going to give a simple gospel presentation and an invitation for salvation. And people begin to get bold, and people begin to do that. And in doing that, we, my, between my friend Sammy Robinson and I, Sammy has seen 475 people it, since April give their life to Christ online. And I wasn't counting at first. I, I, so I can't give you an accurate number because I wasn't counting. God spoke to Sammy to count because God spoke to him and said, I don't want year 2020 to be known as the year of COVID-19, as the year of uh, racial division. I want 2020 to be known as the year of harvest. And so I've seen well over 100 people, so that's well over 575 people saved just between two people sharing the gospel, and all we do is share the gospel, prophesy over people, and pray for healing, move in words of knowledge. And so I want to encourage you, if you're a leader, the first messages of, of, this, of today at 3 o'clock was all about follow me as I follow Christ. Be an example for those to follow. Don't pray for revival as though you want revival more than God does if you're not even willing to preach the gospel. This is, Charles, this is a Charles Finney quote. Far be it from us to, to pray for revival as though we want revival more than God if we're not even willing to preach the gospel. He then goes on to say, we should therefore not just pray for revival, we should pray that God would make us revivalists. <laughs> Lord, we just put your hand on your heart. God, we thank you for the first service. God, we thank you for the message that we've not been given the spirit of bondage again to fear. A large part of the body of Christ is putting their light under a basket of fear, but they haven't been given the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. When we come into this revelation that we've been adopted, that we are a child of God. We come into the revelation, we cannot be rejected for we've already been accepted. So Lord, in this service, as I talk about you, Father, you're a Father, I pray that there would be a baptism in the Father's love. That there would not be one person that leaves this place feeling like an orphan. You said, I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm not gonna leave you an orphan, but I'm gonna send to you the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption. Whew. Right now, you need to know, somebody who's watching live, somebody who's watching right now, you're not alone. The voices in your head are lies. It isn't over. The Lord says, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age, I am your father, you are my child, and I love you, I love you, I love you, because 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 I love you, just because I love you, because I love you, because I love you, because I love you, I'm not surprised at you, I've always loved you, I'm always gonna love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> let him kiss you right now let him kiss you for his house is a house of wine become drunk on the love of god tonight may you drink of his love tonight may you experience the papa god's kiss tonight may you let him kiss you and may his kisses wash away any rejection any feelings of inadequacy any feelings that you cannot do it. For I'm telling you, you can do all things, say all things, all things. through Christ who strengthens you. That includes preach the gospel. <laughs> Your gifting or lack of gifting doesn't disqualify you. Your personality does not disqualify you. It isn't about if, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, if you're shy or not. Number one, I don't believe in shyness. I believe, in, I believe shyness is fear masquerading as a personality type. But once you step into the revelation that God created you, that his perfect image is inside of you, and it might not look like Chris Overstreet, 
when you preach the gospel. It might not look like Todd White. It might not look like that, but it will look like Christ through you. And in doing that, you're expressing your testimony. This is how I've experienced God. This is how I hear God. This is how he shows up in my life when I'm dealing with financial hardships. This is how he comes and comforts me when I feel afraid. Notice how I said feel afraid. You're not afraid. You can't be afraid. You're a child of God. You haven't been given the spirit of fear. So how can you be afraid? You might feel fear, but it's not yours. Come on. This is how he comforts me with his presence. This is how I realign. This is how my house is built upon the rock, and it shall not be shaken no matter what happens, no matter who gets elected into office, no matter what the economic situation is in our nation or the social situation is in our nation. I have joy. I have righteousness. I have peace. You want to know how? Because I met Jesus Christ, and he changed my life, and my life is no longer on shifting sand. I'm not thrown about like a wave of the sea. I am on the rock. The rock is in me and I'm in the rock and you can know Jesus Christ. Come on. I'm telling you the whole earth is moaning and groaning, waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God that we would realize we have a father. Even as they ask Jesus, how do we pray? He starts off saying, our father. If we understood God is a father, we would understand his heart for evangelism. If you understood God as a father, you would realize winning souls brings God so much joy. Does anybody want to bring a smile to the father's face? I live to bring a smile to my father's face. And I know I wake up every day with an A+. I know I do, but I also know every day I can participate with him in winning souls, and in doing that, I'm wise, for he who wins souls is wise. And the beginning of wisdom is to stand in awe and wonder of God. This is how Brian Simmons of the Passion Translation translates the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is to stand in awe and wonder of God. And as we stand in awe and wonder of God, we become impressed with who he is. He impresses his nature on us. And as they see you, they see Christ. And evangelism then isn't something you have to do. It's who you are. You are the light of the world. You cannot be hidden. A light on a hill cannot be hidden. Why? Because I am impressed with the love of God. <laughs> I love that. What are you focusing on? What are we focusing on? I love that, Jahi. Because that's the word God gave me. Tell the church to focus. Focus. Looking unto the author and the finisher of our faith, we do not lose heart. We consider the great cloud of witnesses. We consider that we like sheep are led to the slaughter, every one of us. But even no matter what comes against us, we're more than conquerors through him who saved us, through him who loves us. Come on. I'm telling you, if you have a lack of peace, if you have a lack of joy, it's simply because you've lost the awareness of his presence with you. And you simply have to return, repent, and realize he's with you. Believe. Reject unbelief. Hebrews says, beware lest you have an evil heart of unbelief. We need to understand Everything comes from the heart. The issues of life come from the heart. And if we believe, then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Come on. So we just simply have to make an adjustment, repent, remember who we are. Come on. Remember who he is. And then from that place, we encounter his love and we give it away. We love him because he first loved us. Come on. Are you excited? Man, I could talk about the gospel. I mean, I don't know if you can tell or not. I just love talking about the gospel. I love talking about Jesus. Turn your Bibles, if you will, 2 Corinthians 5. Focus. Say focus. Verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Who died? Uh, 
Come on. And he died for all that no that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, not even the racist. Not even that politician you don't like. No one. How many people do you have permission to regard according to the flesh? No one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is your ministry? Focus. Focus. We're trying to be baited into a fight to fight a fight that is the right fight in the wrong way. Church, don't fall for the bait. Focus on the author and the finisher of your faith. Focus on what your assignment is. What is my assignment? What is my vision? The people without vision cast off all restraint. They do whatever they want. They end up confused, discouraged, hopeless, and they look like the world because they begin to self-medicate again like a dog returns to its vomit. But if you stay focused... If you find that you're going back there, don't stay there. Repent. Repent is not a bad word. It's an invitation. It's a, it's a gift that Jesus has given us because of his blood. We just celebrated the blood of Jesus. Behold, the blood of Jesus who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the blood that washes away our sins. In the moment that you realize you've gone off course, just simply repent and come home. Say, come home. This is what our message is about tonight. Reconciliation, coming home, the Father. Come home to the Father's house. We're going to do a stadium event in Washington, D.C., maybe in 2020. I haven't given up hope yet. And it's going to be called Homecoming. Because the prodigals are coming home. The lost sons and daughters are coming home. And there's two types of lost sons in the prodigal or the superstar father story, as Danny Silk calls it. The lost son who went and spent it on prodigal living and the son that was in the father's house the whole time but just is lost. And they're both coming home in this season. It's homecoming time. We have to focus on what he's called us to do. Turning your Bibles to Luke 15. And we'll get to it if we get to it because now I'm going to talk to you about my, my daughter. <laughs> I have four kids. Abigail Joy, she's nine years old. We lived in Reading when we, um, when we found out we were pregnant with Abigail Joy. And, um, you know, I got saved when I was 18 years old. There could be some people in here who have not yet heard my testimony. I grew up in Virginia where you could throw a rock and hit three churches by accident. There's churches everywhere, Jesus signs everywhere. It'd be hard to grow up in Virginia and not know about Jesus. But how many people know there's a big difference from knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus? And so I knew about Jesus. My dad, when I was about five years old, um, they, my parents divorced when I was two. He was the first um, male in his family that had been divorced. He had a bunch of shame from that. My, mo my mom um, and him got a divorce. And I got to see him on the weekends. But because of child support and the situation, he couldn't pay his electric bill. It was the winter time. I remember it um, because I remember being able to see my breath in the house. We had about a pack of hot dogs in the refrigerator. And my, I remember my dad getting me and my brother up. He's a year younger than me. And, um, and bringing us into the living room and, and putting a tent above the couch. And we thought we're camping in the couch 
in the living room with dad. We just, we had a blast. You know, kids are flexible, man. Kids bounce back easy, man. I'm telling you. And um, we didn't know the difference, but I can't imagine the shame that my father's going through at that time. The shame of feeling like he can't even provide for his family. He's a divorce and his kids are, are, are cold in the night. And he did that because he wanted the body heat on the couch together. And I remember in the morning, he woke, he woke us up, and he, and he put our shoulders together, and he said, look me in the eyes, boys. If you have faith in Jesus, you can do anything in this world. So that's my dad. He had a faith in Jesus. But the, the issue is he only knew what he knew. See, the lost are lost. We don't know what we don't know. We're only walking in the light that we have. But you're the light of the world. What do they see when they meet you? So my dad was um, a functional drinker, we'll call it that, uh, a couple times a week, partier, smoker, uh, uh, truck driver. No one would probably really know that he's a Christian, except for us, you know. And that was my example of a Christian. My mom, she gave her life to Christ um, because she wanted to get married to my dad. And in the Baptist church that they were going to get married in, you had to be baptized in that church to do that. And so she was in love with my dad, so she got baptized and saved. Now, the thing about my mom is, is she thought that she could never be saved. God couldn't love her because when she was 14 years old, she got pregnant by her boyfriend, and her mother made her get an abortion, took her down to the um, clinic and made her get an abortion. And so after that, she got three more abortions. And because of those, she thought, there's no way I could be saved, but maybe I could get my kids saved. And so every now and then, she would take us to, uh, make us go to VBS, which we hated, um, because it had the word school in it, and uh, we didn't want to go to school in the summer. And um, so I got a little bit of a foundation there, and I remember at 11 years old, she took us to a Christmas service, and every now and then she would take us to services. Like, usually, she was codependent. She was attracted to guys that she could fix, which how many people know that's not a good plan? And so we had a rotating door of fathers in and out of my life. Um, they would be some there for a year, some there for two or three years. And um, because I wasn't their blood, they, they really was, weren't like fathers to me until it became football season because I was in the newspapers and I was really good at football. And in and, and Virginia, it's like religion, football. And especially where I was from in, in the Peninsula District is where Michael Vick played football and a bunch of other people played football. It's just a big hotbed for NFL talent. And so because I was in the newspapers, all, all of a sudden, I'm like, this is my son, you know. And then all of a sudden, they would get broke up, and I would never hear from them again. So you can imagine the effect that's having on my heart coming up. I had a desire to have a father in my life that was proud of me on a consistent basis. Now, when I got to see my dad on the weekends, I had that, but I didn't get to see him very often. I'll go back into that later. And so... Um, at 11 years old, my mother took us to a Christmas service, and I remember it was a Baptist church hearing Dr. James White preach the gospel. It was a simple Christmas message, and um, my heart was convicted. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed a Savior at 11 years old, and I was the only person to courageously walk down, it was about 500 people there, to the front and give my life to Christ. And I remember the pastor was already in the aisle shaking people's hands to go. And I tapped him on the back. He turned around and he said, what do you need? I said, I want to give my life to Christ. And his eyes filled with tears. And it was like I was looking into eyes of glass. It was like I was looking into the eyes of Jesus. I remember it. It was imprinted on me in that day. And I remember going home after that experience and going into my sister's room. She was on visitation at her dad's house. She had a different dad than us. And I went in there to be alone. And I heard the Lord for the first time, and, he, and this is what he spoke to me. Actually, it was for the second time, because no one says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. So the moment that somebody chooses to say yes to Jesus, they've already heard his voice. Now it's our job to teach them, to disciple them how to continue to hear God's voice, because salvation isn't just that they said a prayer. Salvation is that they know the Lord. Come on. And so... I prayed a prayer. I went into my, my, my sister's room, and I heard the Lord speak to me, you need to start honoring your mother. That's what I heard him say. And I guess because of everything, I wasn't honoring her. And, um, and then I never went back to church, so I never got discipleship. So I thought, I'm saved. Fire insurance Christianity. You know, I'm saved. I got a ticket to heaven. I prayed the prayer. And so from 11 to 18 years old, 
I got 18 felonies being saved. I'm in and out of juvenile detention. I'm a fighter. I got a reputation for fighting because I could knock people out. I was scared of fighting. I didn't like fighting. But once you get a reputation as a fighter, people who want to fight search you out to fight you. And I was getting in, in and out of trouble on a regular basis. And I remember one day I punched this guy in the face at a soccer game because um, it, was a, it was a crazy reason why I did it, but I, I didn't actually want to go back to juvenile detention. I went to the soccer game because nobody was there at soccer games. In Virginia, nobody watches soccer. They only watch football. So I went there to, to stay out of trouble. This guy shows up. A whole situation happens. I end up punching the dude in the face. I tell people when you don't know the Lord and you're trying to stay out of trouble, trouble will find you. And so here's the redemption of God. I punch this guy in the face. His girlfriend calls the cops on me. I have to go back to jail. She's screaming. She's crying, everything. I go back to jail. I get out. Two years later, I meet these radically saved black dudes painting houses, exterior painting. And they would pick me up in the morning blasting Kurt Franklin and wow gospel music on the radio, talking about Jesus said this, and Jesus said that, and Jesus healed sister such and such. And all they want to do is talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all day long. See, this is the purest form of evangelism. Out of the overflow of your heart, you can't help yourself. Up to that point, I lived in Virginia where you could throw a rock and hit three churches by accident, and never once did somebody preach the gospel to me. Never once up to that point had I ever met somebody who was unashamed of their faith, who couldn't help themselves, who was shining, who was demonstrating what it looks like to love God with all of their heart, not some of your heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Come on. I'm telling you, I believed in my heart, therefore I spoke. I'm telling you, God is putting his finger on idols in our life that are stealing away our first love fire because there's a whole world who's dying and going to hell because the church is lukewarm. And the invitation is actually because God is an all-consuming fire. He's a jealous God. God is love, 1 John 4, but he's an all-consuming fire. He's a jealous God because love is jealous. And love always has the highest and best for what it's pointed at. He's not jealous because he's insecure. He's jealous because he's the best for your life. And anything less than him is less than the best. Come on. The invitation, his, his love is consuming him and he wants your love for him to consume you. And when I met these guys, there was something about them, this fire that drew me to the Lord. And I remember I would cross the bridge in the morning. The Coleman Bridge is Yorktown. For those historians, you know that's where America won our independence. And I would cross from Gloucester to Yorktown in the morning, and the sun would be rising on the one side of the water. And it would be setting on the other side when I would come home. And it was like three days in a row the sunrise was beautiful than the one before, and the sunset was more beautiful than the one before. And it was like I had never seen the sunrise or sunset before that. Psalm 19 says, day unto day utter speech, night unto night knowledge. The sun is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, running its race from one end of heaven to the other end. Nothing's hidden from its heat. It talks about, goes on to talk about how the skies, the stars, the sunrise, creation is testifying that God is real and that he loves us. And this is my story. As I saw that on the third day, the sun was glistening off the river and all of a sudden I had this revelation. The fish that are in this river were created for a purpose. And if they're in the river, they're going to fulfill their purpose. They were created to swim. But if they're on the bank, number one, they're not going to be fulfilled. But number two, they're not even going to live. And all of a sudden, I came into this revelation. Hold on, God, you created me too. And I'm guaranteed to live a fulfilled life. If I surrender my whole life... Not a little bit. See, I think some people have, have, have surrendered some of their life to Christ, but not the totality of their life to Christ. Not that little idol over there. Not that little bit of social media, extra social media you want to consume. Not that other little vice. They haven't surrendered everything. 
Listen, it's not by might, not by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's by his grace. But once we come into this revelation of the love of the Father, it's not something we have to give up. It's something we don't want anymore because we realize we have everything we need in him. He sustains us. Come on. He's our source. I saw that sunrise and I realized that and I said out loud on my pickup truck, God, I'll give you my whole life right now. I want to fulfill the purpose that you created for me. And in that moment, it was like all of heaven poured out on me. It was like 10,000 gallons of liquid love poured over my head. And I began to weep and cry and I got radically born again in my pickup truck in that moment. I was a different person right away. Immediately, I began to hear God's voice, and, and, and I began to share the gospel knowing nothing except for John 3, 16, how to buy you a cheeseburger and tell my testimony. And people are getting born again all the time. I went into Walmart after that, built up my courage, memorized the Romans road, and stood up in front of all of Walmart and preached the gospel at the top of my lungs because zeal for my father's house had consumed me. And I went in there, and the whole time, the lady is chirping, sir, 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 you can't do that here. You can't do that. I totally ignored her. I hadn't learned the core value of honor yet. I totally ignored her, and I said, and if you want to get saved, meet me at the front door quick, because she's dialing 911. And that's not good for somebody who has a criminal history, so... So I get radically saved. Not long after that, God calls me to do missionary work. And, um, and he calls me to YWAM, Youth of the Mission, or Young Women After Men. And I met my wife there. She's sitting on the front row. <laughs> and I told the Lord, I'll go anywhere in the world for you except for Russia. But I'll even go there, but have mercy on my soul, because you know I don't like the cold. Don't send me to the frozen tundra, and I say God has a sense of humor, because I forgot to say Canada. <laughs> and this beautiful Canadian girl came in to the YWAM, and I thought I was supposed to be the Apostle Paul and not be married, but I couldn't quit thinking about this girl. She was consuming me. It didn't matter what you talked to me about. I was going to talk about this girl, and ended up dating her. We get married, and we had a plan we ended up moving back to Redding, California. We lived there for about a year, and we had a plan. We're not going to get, um, mar- we're not going to have any babies for five years. Man plans his ways, and God directs his steps. That was our plan. We're going to travel. We're going to do some stuff, and about we lasted about a year and a half. <laughs> pregnant, surprise. I guess we had something to do with it. We just weren't planning it. So we get pregnant. I, I had this encounter. I would help Chris Overstreet do these evangelism trainings, and he would ask me to take people out on the streets and stuff. And I'm worshiping God, and, and I go into this encounter, and I go into this trance, and I'm pushing this little girl on a swing. She jumps off the swing. She lands. She, dry, she comes back around the swing, and I see my daughter's face for the first time. A butterfly flies between us, and I'm back in the room, and the Lord says, you're going to have a little girl named her Abigail Joy. And um, so I go home and I tell Chelsea, I don't know if this will be our first child or not, because he didn't tell me whether this was going to be our girl or not. Um, And we had a plan, too, by the way. We thought we were going to have a boy first. That's what our plan was. And I was going to train him to fight. That way his sister could not date anybody in high school. I think that's a good plan, right? Anyway, so... I said, I don't know if this is going to be our girl or not, but eventually we're going to have a little girl. We have to name her Abigail Joy. Chelsea said, I always wanted to name my first daughter Abigail. She never told anybody. So anyway, we get the first ultrasound. They say, it's a boy. So we name him Gabriel. And I begin to sing over Gabriel in the womb, so I thought. And I would sing this song, Lord, you are more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing compares to you. You guys know that song? Nothing I desire compares to you. Now, back up. The reason I would sing that song is because right after I got saved, I went to this Baptist church before I went to YWAM. And when I went in there, 
I did my first Bible study, and this girl comes up to me after the Bible study. She has blonde hair, and she says, hey, Richie, were you at a soccer game two years ago, and you punched this dude in the face? And I'm thinking, this girl has blonde hair, that girl had, and I got embarrassed. She said, oh, don't worry about it, Richie. That day I started praying for your soul. Don't discount the power of your prayer. All evangelism starts on your knees. It starts in a place of prayer. It starts in a place of gaining the heart of the Father for his lost children. And it will make a difference if you pray and don't give up. And so this girl, Catherine Oder, also um, sang this a cappella song on a river. We were just the three of us on a beach, and she began to sing, Lord, you are more precious than silver, more costly than gold more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. Acapella over and over, and we sang that. It was the first time I felt the presence of God in song. We sang the same song for two hours. Before we know it, we're on our backs, just weight of God's presence going through us. And so for my whole life since that time, if I ever get an opportunity and I get afraid or I feel afraid, um, then I'll instantly sing that song again because it recalibrates me. He's with me, and he'll never leave me. And so when I, we got pregnant with my child, I began to sing that song over her in the womb because I wanted the child to grow up in the presence of God. I wanted her or him to know the presence of God. And what I didn't realize is that at a certain point in time, a baby develops the ability to hear in the womb. So she would hear my voice throughout the day, every day singing over her the same song, feeling the presence of God with her father's voice. Now, my wife got a hold of a book called Supernatural Pregnancy. Any, any women in here ever get a hold of that book? It's a great book. I mean, the premise is that pain for childbirth came in at the fall and that Jesus died on the cross and the curse of pain was on the cross and therefore you don't have to have pain during childbirth and let me tell you i believe in that but how many people know you can believe something and you have a different experience <laughs> chelsea carried that book around like it was the bible i mean she would preach this thing to herself all the time and she would preach it to me and she would tell me if you see me getting afraid of, or fear you put on some kim walker and and so i can feel the presence of god so fast forward, the day that our child is to be due, and, 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 and um, it's, it's due date. You know, we're going to have this baby, and, and we start having the baby, or she does. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she starts feeling some pain, and I'm praying for her, and then it would subside a little bit, and she started feeling some more pain. And I'm telling you, it started getting crazy. I mean, she is scratching my arms to pieces like, like she's possessed or something, screaming, and all the kinds of crazy stuff is going down. And um, I said, you want to hear Kim Walker? And she said, no, I don't want to hear Kim Walker. Don't you touch me again. Like, don't touch me. Just, you know, it was wild for like 20 some odd hours of wildness. Like, and eventually the baby came. I'm not prophesying to anybody. I'm just saying this is. This is not, that has to be your, I'm not trying to cause fear. I, there's, we have friends that just, I mean, I, I, know, um, uh, I know friends that just had the baby, no pain at all. It was great. That just wasn't our experience. <laughs> baby comes out, ah, screaming, and the lights are in the face, and it's messy, and I make sure Chelsea's alive and okay, and, and I go over to the baby, and she's like, ah, and they're wiping her off in the hot bed and stuff. And, and I lean in and I just start singing. Lord, you are. And the moment I start singing, she quits crying. And she stretches her little head over and strains her eyes open. It's the first time I see my daughter eye to eye. And I know in that moment she's seeing the voice of the one who's been singing over her since she's been in the womb. Psalm 139 says that God knit you in your mother's womb, that his thoughts for you are more than the sand on the seashore, more than the stars that are in the heaven. If you understood that your father, that God is a father, you would understand his heart for evangelism. 
I can't describe to you the love that I felt for my daughter in that moment. I pray that you would know the love of God that goes beyond knowledge. There's a love that goes beyond knowledge that you can know, but you can know by experience. That's one of them. The love of God is another one. But your father loves you so much. And he loves every single person that you'll ever meet, no matter what, who they are or what they've done, with the same love. He knit them in their mother's womb. And he died for us while we were yet still sinners. Not because we had it all together. This is the invitation that we have. It's the invitation to reconciliation. And Jesus said this parable, it's in Luke 15. There was a father who had two sons, and the younger son said, give me my inheritance now. His father gives him the inheritance. He takes it. He spends it everywhere, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And a famine comes in the land, and he gets hungry. I believe that many prodigals in this time, in this shaking of our nation, are getting hungry right now. And hunger produces humility. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And in their humility, they're going to begin to search and grope for truth. And that's where you come in. A city on the hill shining that knows the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That you would be one in him and he's one in you. That the glory which was given to him before the foundation of the earth, he now gives it to you. And he says, because of our unity, the world will know that he was sent from the Father. Our union with him and our union with each other, this common union that we just did as we partook of the bread and the blood, the cup. This is the gospel that we get to share. And the son comes home and the father meets him on his way with a ring and a robe. And he's thinking, I'll just be a servant. But the father says, no way, I'm throwing you a party. And there was another son who wasn't at the party. And even though he was in the father's house, he was lost the whole time. But the father doesn't stay in the party. He goes outside of the party to find his other son. And there's a lot within the church that have been in the church the whole life, like in Virginia, going through the motions but not burning on fire. And they don't know what they don't know. And even as Jesus said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, even doing miracles in my name, casting out devils in my name, doing many wonders in my name. And I'll say to them, I believe with a broken heart, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, for I never knew you. There's those who are in the Father's house who don't know the Lord, and yet the Father in this story going to get them too, pleading with them. Listen, your, your, your brother was once dead, now he's alive. He was lost, now he's found. If we had to make Mary because he's home, and we don't have any evidence that they ever returned home, but the invitation is there. The Father loves you, and he loves them. Can we see what he sees? Because if we can, then we can speak to it. If I can get somebody to come up on the keys, I'm going to move into, what time do I have to finish, by the way? Right now? All right. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for right now what you're doing in the atmosphere, what you're doing in our hearts. Father, I thank you for the hot tears, the tears that I see coming down on people's face. But God, it's more than just a good message, more than just a story, more than just our hearts being stirred with emotion, God. God, I'm praying right now for a kiss from your, from your lips to our face, God. I'm praying for the kiss of affirmation, the kiss, God, of of adoption, God, the baptism in the Father's love, God. God, we just, just put your hands up above your head, almost like, a, like I got a three-year-old, and when she wants to be picked up, she puts her hands up a certain type of a way. She says, pick me up. I want you to pick, put your hands up towards the Father in a way that you would like him to pick you up, hold you, spin you around, sing over you, just as I was singing over my child, 
in the womb. The Father's been singing a song over you since you were created in the womb. God, sing over us tonight. Let us hear your voice. Let us smell your fragrance. God, recalibrate the hearts of those who are watching to a place of peace, righteousness, and joy, God, the kingdom. Pick us up, God. Pick us up. Pick us up. Let him kiss you with the kisses of his mouth. Hey. Yeah, just begin to sing a new song to him. Just, just begin to let out a sound. Bethel, let out a sound. Hey. Come on, lift up your voice. Just let out a, a sound, that groaning sound, that sound of the Holy Spirit when we don't know what to sing, when we don't know what to pray, but the Spirit within us sings a song. It's a song that says, I'm yours. I'm your child. As many as received him, he's given the right to become a child of God. He's given you the right to become his child. You're a child. You're his child. He says, you're my beloved daughter. You're my beloved son. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I remember right after I got saved, I went into this empty room and my mom had a condo. She hadn't moved any of her furniture into the room. No, no, nothing was in the place. She lived on the Chesapeake Bay and there was a bad storm that rolled in and lightning was hitting the hitting the water and spider web of electricity all over the water it was the most awesome thunderstorm I'd ever seen on the Chesapeake Bay and as I'm watching that I began to worship God I didn't even know any Christian songs yet I was brand new saved and so I didn't I didn't have my K-Love I used to listen to K-Love right after I got saved that's the only thing I knew of and I didn't have it and so I just began to sing a new song to the Lord just a song of my heart. And as I begin to sing that song, all of a sudden, the presence of God began to roll in in waves, just waves of the presence of God. It was like it would roll over me and hit me, and then it would just release and then come back and hit me again. And it was increasing and increasing, and I began to sing more and sing more. Before you knew it, I, I didn't even have any words anymore, so I just began to let out the sound, the sound, the groaning sound of an earth that's groaning, <sighs> of my, my being within me that knows I'm not born for here. I, I'm, I'm an alien in this earth, but at the same time, I know that my home is in the Lord. I began to sing. And as I'm singing and singing and singing to the Lord, it's increasing and it's increasing. Before I know it, I'm on my back, flat out on the ground, and it was like 10,000 pounds on me. I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. Now, I'm going to a Baptist church. They don't teach you about any of this at the time, but I'm singing in another language, and this, and this uh, weight was on me. I tried to get up. I couldn't get up, and I just kept singing. I thought I was on the ground for 20 minutes. I was on the ground for over two hours. When I finally was able to pull myself up into my chair, I heard the Father. He said, son, I'm proud of you. Keep going. He called me son. He called me son. And he said that he was proud of me. And I didn't realize how much my heart growing up in a fatherless home needed to hear from the father that he was proud of me that I was his son maybe you've heard other people's testimonies but you've never heard the father on the day that Jesus was baptized he came out of the water and the spirit of God descended upon him like a dove and a voice was heard this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I just sense right now, if we'll just begin to, to, to completely focus on God, we can have more than just a service right now. You can have more than just a good message right now. If you'll begin to completely just sing to the Lord your heart, minister to Him as a priest right now, 
Step into your identity. You were born to minister to God. Maybe stand up if you can, if you want, or, or if you want to go get on your face or get on your knees or whatever you need to do. But I want to encourage you to posture yourself in a way that you can engage God and just begin to minister to Him. Let's let a sound just begin to rise. Hey, la na 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 na